anything that we do. We're one of the Filipino brands that, that has made it globally. Our responsibility, what we do here, is not just for us, but for the country also, to show Filipinos that we can make it, that we can compete on a global platform. Being here allows us to contribute and make a difference. Uh, we're very proud that we somehow contribute you know, to making the country better known for good design. They don't do anything with computers, everything is still drawn by hand. So even when you present your work, it has to look pretty much like what you want it to look like with your drawing. I've worked at Kenneth Long enough in, in various roles. Uh, it's very challenging working with Kenneth. Uh, my friends tell me that uh, in my time here, I've grown as a person, but better person. How is it like to work with and for? I like to think that I work with Kenneth. I mean, of course, he's my boss, he's the owner, so I work for him, but I prefer to say that I really work with him. <laughs> Extension again of uh, that childhood. So I grew up in a 
very Chinese family. So my father had a lot of uh, businesses from finance to an auto dealership to a travel agency. Um, and so my mom had a furniture factory. When my father passed away, I was still abroad and I had to come back to take the reins of the family businesses. And uh, I closed all the companies uh, one by one because I didn't know anything really about it. And I sought to uh, put all my eggs into the furniture basket. It was a very risky thing, but I've always believed that you should get into something that you're passionate about and that you really know what you're doing instead of uh, trying to do so many things. They don't just say yes to everyone when I was working with them because it also impacts your whole branding. I think like putting your name on your work for me is really important as well. I feel like he really pushed me to, to work harder and think harder until I got the best option out. And these are some of the samples that you take inspiration from everywhere, from weaves, from different, uh, from fashion. It's the Chinese in me, you know, and my father was a Chinese businessman, my mother was a creative, and that's how I think they molded me to the left and the right brain. Ken happens to have this unique position, okay, where he is able to make change, not just in Cebu, but nationally, internationally. It's a unique position because while he is a designer, he also has the history, the education, the exposure to be able to create new designs and impact on the culture. And we support him and rally behind him. He's not doing it alone. One time, Kenneth came back from a funeral and he was very pensive. So I said, Kenneth, what's, what's going on with you? And he was talking about the eulogy, you know, of that person who died. And he said, when, when I die, you know, I wonder what you will say about me. So I said, Says, you know, I just want to, I don't know if you'll ever reply to this, but 
I'm very, very happy. I'm very proud of you because my employer thinks that all Filipinos are just you know, um, middle and working class. And I want to show them that someone can make a difference. And uh, that letter touched me. And uh, I still keep it until today. And uh, then I understood that whenever I go abroad too, my stand has become like a, uh, like a home for other Filipinos when they come and, they, and we talk you know, and they share their pride. I think it's a great thing. Sometimes I think that maybe that's why all this is uh, um, worth something. I think more important than my actual body of work is actually the inspiration that uh, I bring to millions of Filipinos to make a difference in the world of design or in any field is something that, uh, that I think uh, we all aspire to and look forward to. And so every designer dream is to change and influence society for the better. And uh, myself included. So anything that I do, I always want I always want to give back to the community in any way I can. Um, whether it be for government or public projects. The money is secondary. I think it's really seeing um, being able to help, being able to have your work enjoyed by many people. Designing for the mass market is something that every designer aspires to. And that's why you have big fashion designers designing for mass brands. I think it's every designer's dream to have his work accessible to everyone. But I make no pretensions about it. It's very difficult to create a mass market product for the Philippines. Just because of rising costs, the labor costs are high, cost of power and lack of materials and most of these things are made in China so that's where everything is used. But I choose to read the Philippines. I choose to sell everything here it's more expensive and so I make no pretensions that I can design for the mass market because I choose to live in this country. So you had a very good introduction there to Mr. Kenneth Hoppe with his videos. But allow me to give you a brief introduction taken from his profile. Mr. Kenneth Hoppe is known or was dubbed by Time Magazine as Rattan's first virtuoso, as he has used Rattan as well as other locally sourced materials using these and industrial process. He has created furniture for which you've seen the samples, the video, and I'm sure when you visit his showroom and have seen the fame and other uh, exhibitions which has taken part. He is currently the head of the industrial design program of the College of St. Pinel, but he has a graduate of the interior design, industrial design program of the Pratt Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kenneth Kovanbo. So good morning, everyone. And uh, I didn't realize that video was so long, but that wasn't my idea. It was the faculty's idea to show that so, but thank you all, thank you all for coming. And I hope in this uh, short hour, I'll be able to show you now how I grew, um, how I transformed a dream of mine to create good design, to be known for it, and how I made that into a, the global brand that it is today. So, okay, so as you see, this is me when I had less hair in Cebu. My mother was a furniture designer who created her own technique of working with Rattan, and she has an invention patent, which is 
um, still being used today. So these were her designs, and back then, this was in the 80s, about 84, 85, this was very new, this was very uh, revolutionary. She took these uh, pieces of rattan and she laminated them one on top of the other over very sculptural um, bowls. And as a child, I, the factory was just behind our house, so I began to play with all the little materials. I spent time with all the craftsmen, learning how to hammer, how to work with uh, wood, with all, you know, and, and I accompanied my mother to all the furniture shows, trying to sell her furniture. So I went to Paris, I went to, uh, to, um, to New York, and, and so from a very young age, I kind of learned already how the furniture industry works globally. Uh, my father still believed that there was no money in design, so he really wanted me to take up business. So I took up business in UP, and after two years, I decided that this wasn't for me. I couldn't take the accounting, I couldn't take the numbers, and so I applied to the industrial design program. And uh, there was an exam, there was a painting and drawing exam, uh, which I failed, so they didn't accept me. Um, but a few years ago, the same school asked me to be their commencement speaker at their graduation. So that was my sweet revenge. Um, so I went to um, the Pratt Institute, my mother is where my mother graduated, and I learned to play with all these forms, and I learned that form can bring about emotions in us. Um, looking, manipulating form, um, I was very, very happy in my first year because this opened up a whole world of possibilities for me. And then I went to work in, uh, in Italy, where I worked in a leather and a wood workshop. And from there, I began to appreciate all the things that I grew up with. You know, when you look at your country from a distance, you begin to admire the craft, the things that make you different as a people. And then it was time to come back. When my father passed away, I had to go back and then I wanted to make a difference in the world of design. It was very different, very difficult, it still is today, to really make an impact on the global world of design. And so one time when I was trying to um, come up with a design, I saw this tree that I grew up with, and I saw how that tree looked so different that day, because all the branches just created these beautiful patterns, and when the light uh, went through it, you know, it would create this glow. And as you go closer, different patterns, different transparencies would emerge, and so on. And I wanted to design furniture just like that tree. So I started with a very, very basic uh, sketch, a very basic uh, wireframe, um, and I made it, I curved it a bit, then I took rattan, and then I wrapped it around that wireframe, and uh, then I took more wicker, I wrapped that with rattan skin to create like an organic, like a wall, like this, this two, this organic structure. And so this is my first design. People liken it to like a Corbusier chair or a, a Hoffman chair, but what makes it different is its, it's transparency. And uh, when you put it on a balcony like this, it allows, it doesn't block out the view, it allows the light to come through. And so, I knew that I was on to something. I had discovered something different, just like that tree. What makes nature beautiful is when we, when we see through foliage, we see right through it. You know, it's, it's dense, but what makes it beautiful is its transparency. And I knew that I could use, I could get that effect by using the same natural materials that were out there. And so I began to look at other things, um, like uh, baskets. I find baskets very fascinating because they're very simple, and yet every member of that basket is there for a purpose. They all contribute to the overall strength and structure. So my second design was called the balloon. It has a very, very light steel frame, and then I used rattan. Um, and uh, this rattan was then tied down by nylon twine and abacar rope. And as you can see in my designs, because it's transparent, the interior has to be as beautiful as the exterior, because you can't hide anything. And this is the detail of that uh, piece. By bending rattan, you create strength, and uh, that's held in place. The tent, it's held in place by these abaca um, ropes. 
The, the, this design is called the uh, Baloo, named after um, the bear in the Jungle Book. Okay. And uh, so, I, I growing up in Cebu, you know, fishing is very much a part of the life of the people. I was inspired by all these traps, you know, these fish traps. So I designed uh, my third collection called uh, Amaya. It was a dining table. It's made out of coconut um, twig, coconut spine, and. Uh, the press likened it to like trapping a hurricane inside a cylinder, and uh, this is these are the chairs that went that go with it, and you can see that they create very very beautiful textures and patterns uh, on the ground, especially when the sunlight um, hits it. And uh, that chair is called dimple because of the holes, the, like dimples on the cheek, and actually they're stackable. The two back legs go in there. Okay, so. Then, then I decided to do something that was totally different, and which was to brand myself. You know, you had, back then, you didn't have many options in selling your furniture. So companies from abroad would come, they would take your furniture, they would label it under different names, they'd sell it however they wanted. You really had, though, you were just a manufacturer you know, who happened to make good design. So I wanted to change all that, and I wanted to put my name on it. For a few years, I lost a lot of clients. and. Uh, um, there for about, in fact, for about two years, the factory floor was empty. So my mother was telling me, what, what in the world are you doing? That because, but I really wanted to be known as an artist. I wanted this product to be known as, as made in the Philippines, and I insisted. And slowly it paid off. Okay, so this is some of the early marketing materials I used. This image of this lady on a sofa called a croissant. This is made out of uh, petal and uh, coconut uh, and puri. The, the material they use for the holistic thing. And uh, in all my marketing materials, I always put my name. And so a subsequent design of mine is called the Pigam. It was inspired by the human body. And it uses a very, very light um, sculptural frame of steel that's then tied down um, with as many as 3,000 knots on the abacaro. So it looks like a computer rendering. And uh, in fact, the Korean Museum of Modern Art then called it a perfect example of uh, Asian design. And this is the love seat. Yeah. And see, now you can see an example of these chairs being used outdoors. And they look like they belong outdoors. They, they, they look like they, they come from nature and they're part of nature. So this is the bed that uh, made me uh, a name in my country, the Voyage Bed. Um, uh, this, this was the bed that uh, you know, Brad Pitt and, and, and Angelina bought. And uh, in fact, I never knew that that could become a marketing thing. You know? So it was only after, three years after, when, when somebody, when one of the press from here asked, you know, who, who among celebrity clients use your name? I said, oh yeah, you know, there's a guy by the name of Brad Pitt who bought this piece. And uh, again, it takes Hollywood to get you known in your own country. Um, and so then I wanted to take my designs further, because I was only using natural materials. And with natural materials, your designs were always brown, because that's the color of dead plants. So um, I began to experiment with fabric, and I made different kinds of weaves, different kinds of uh, textures to create this design called the drag print. And I was so happy because now I could put color in my designs and opened up again a whole world of possibilities. Um, so inspired by cathedrals and, and church structures, this is the, I went on a trip on Turkey and came up with this design inspired by the Hagia Sophia vaulted ceiling. And, uh, I, I looked at sweaters and I imagined what they would be like if I blew these sweaters up. And still using fabric, created this collection called a cabaret. And this is cabaret used um, outside. Again, this is very, very different in the global world of design. I presented this in Milan back then, and there was nothing like it. It was using, these are using uh, foam. There's a foam tube inside that's then wrapped with fabric. And to go outdoors, we use um, acrylic fabric. Okay, so I'm inspired by everything, anything. 
heavy things as mundane as a crushed coke can. This is the Lola so Lola chair, easy armchair, and uh, this collection won for a very significant award. It's called the Design for Asia Award uh, in 2005. This award is given in Hong Kong. It's normally only given to industrial products like Sony, Hyundai, Samsung. This year, they decided to award it to Rattan Chair. It's that's the only time that the Filipinos won that award, and it's it's considered Asia's highest award for design. This is the Lola. This is how it's made. It's very simple. It starts out uh, with a with a rattan that's bent um, with uh, with heat to create a, to make a frame like this, and then that frame is held in place by by a rattan that's cut into thick strips, and this is what it looks like. It's a similar technique to uh, boat building, and this is the Lola chair down top with a cushion and used outdoors. So this is the full collection. Um, again, this is the natural version. I think so it's again brown. And uh, yeah, so in everything I do, I always try to perfect because what we're doing is actually uh, a propagation of a craft. You know, I, in many parts of the world, in almost every part of the world, the craft is dying. People don't want to work with their hands anymore. And so what I think what I'm doing is to preserve this craft and to carry it further. So I just want to show you some of the many techniques that we use and the amount of work that goes into a chair. This is called the Luna chair, designed in 2001. It won um, an award in New York for craftsmanship. Uh, so it starts out with a frame with a shell out of a uh, rattan that's coiled around itself. And then it's taken out of the mold. And then we put wooden legs on it, put wooden legs in the bottom. We put a bed of um, recycled foam then jute sack, and then the weaving starts. And uh, the weaving is quite intricate, it's complex, um, and this one, this is what happens. This is what it looks like after a day. And uh, so the craftsmen, the, the, the beauty about this chair is there are two patterns, one coarser one on the outside, and a finer one on the inside. And now the craftsman has to take these two patterns and definitely stitch them together like this. It's something that can only really be done in our country. And uh, believe me, people have tried abroad to copy it. But it's very, very, it's very intricate. It's very, it's a very difficult chair to do. I want to show you another chair um, in wood. This is called the tail arm chair. Those of you who work with wood know how difficult it is to cut something at precise angles, to join them together uh, with dowels. And uh, in fact, in our factory of 300 craftsmen, only two can make this chair. And this is the tilt. It's like a miniature house. Yeah, this is the tilt easy arm chair made of uh, American walnut. Okay. And so, <clears throat> one of the challenges is the design that always you come across. The two most difficult things to design is a chair. Okay, because a chair. It's very, very simple. There's so many chairs out there. So you have to justify the existence of your chair, uh, the need for it. And uh, the other thing are tables, because we all have preferences for tables. It's either wood or glass or stone. And when you try to do too much to the base, um, when the chairs go around it, it gets all covered up anyway. So I, I wanted to play with the edges of a table by taking an old book, and I wanted to mimic that uh, those pages. So I took veneer, I cut them into strips, I laminated them on top of the other, and to create this very, very wavy, always random edge. And this is the parchment dining table. And this looks like a book that's floating on stainless steel legs. These are the parchment chairs. They look like bound manuscripts. The covers are removable. Yeah. And uh, this is their this is the cabinet that goes with that collection. They look like stacks of paper that are put inside a wooden case. So I'm really inspired by anything can inspire us. You know? Even Blades of Grass became the Yoda chair. This is undoubtedly the best-selling chair here in the Philippines, the most well-known, the most copied too. Um, so a bowl of noodles becomes the noodle chair. Uh, this is 
my own version of a sheep called a Harry. This is Harry in its natural habitat. And uh, even things, that, uh, you know, everyday things like dim sum st steamers became then uh, dim sum coffee tables made out of leather and bamboo. So I, I'm always fascinated by techniques that are found in fashion. And this is my attempt at creating a very fashionable chair. It's like making a gown. And this is one of the most difficult chairs to do because Upholstered chairs is really not our domain. You know, when we say Filipino, it's always made out of natural materials. It always involves some weaving. It never involves fabric and foam. They, we're just not competitive in that. And the Italians are the best when it comes to when it comes to this. And so this was a risk and a challenge. And also because our people were not trained to work with this. They were trained to work with rattan, you know, not fabric and foam. And uh, this was very difficult to do. But we, because of the success of this chair called the Bloom, we had to make an entire department of people just train into like making like a, you know like gowns draped over bases. And so this is yeah, this is the leaf. This is the chair. Also, it's like a mannequin on steel in a steel frame. So inspired by structures like Ferris wheels, bicycles made this design called uh, Papillon, which is like a, a hammock. It looks like Imelda's sleeves um, for our furry friends. This is um, inspired by the Sydney Opera House, and this is called Operetta. Yeah. So one time, um, I wanted to join this, this show, which many of you know. This is, this is the most uh, significant design show in the world, uh, at the uh, Salon de Milano. Because of this show, in fact, the furniture, this event has now displaced the fashion um, event. It's become now the most important event in, in Italy in, in terms of design. And so I wanted to exhibit there. But when they learned that I was from the Philippines, they wanted to put me up on the third floor close to some bathroom at the back. Um, so I knew that I wasn't going to impress the organizers with, by showing them more furniture, because they probably have that coming out of their ears already. So I wanted to do something very different. And so I asked them, I said, if I did something really crazy for you, like a, like a car made out of bamboo, you know, would you consider putting me in the front? So they said, yeah, if, if you do it, you know, they were laughing. Yeah, we, we put it right in front. This is very different. So this was the challenge, starting to make these little pod-like pod structures based on um, based my design. And uh, I finished it. I came up with this design called the Phoenix. And they really did put me up in front, right in front of the building when you came in. You know? And uh, up to this day, I still get a very good spot in the Milan, in the, in the fair. You know? And so have other Filipino companies come after, come after. So this is the Phoenix. It's made out of rattan, carbon fiber, steel. It's an electric car. I didn't have time then to put an engine in it but it's now in a university in uh, Germany. It's a very lightweight structure, but very, very strong. This is the um, team that built it. And, you know, uh, people think that it's, it's play. Well, it was all play for me, you know, just, I had fun doing it. But I got invitations from Mercedes-Benz, from Audi, from their team, to speak in front of their designers about, you know, the using natural materials, and uh, you know, they all think I've been doing this all my life. Yeah. And this is, to me, this has really opened my eyes of how we, uh, as a country who know, have, who play no part at all in the world of automotive design and manufacturing, can actually make you know, big manufacturers open their eyes and see what happens when you take a shell that's biodegradable, that's light, that, that wears out after five months, and it's easy to replace, and uh, you know, um, because the, the, in the automotive industry, cars are one of the biggest pollutants, you know, in terms of uh, not only in their actual use, but also um, you see a lot because cars outlive their purpose, and so you see them there in, in junkyards, you know, rotting away. And so I wrote a whole um, treatise on this, and up until now, it still gets really good press. This was done almost ten years ago, in fact. OK, 
Okay, so okay, can't show it now, but it's been in an ad, and it's been it's now in a book that was just published a few months ago, a very important book. It's called Post Petroleum Design, now published in New York by George Elgin. It's in a, it was used by an ad from a Belgian bank. You know, it says tomorrow is what we make it. Yeah, and this is the do we have volume? This is the it's an ad. We have um, showrooms around the world. You know, we have one here in Manila, um, we have one in New York. Uh, this is the one in Manila. And uh, okay, um, very well. We will talk about the marketing part later. So every designer wants to influence society. That includes me. So I design other things aside from furniture. I did happen to do, do the airport you know, a few years ago with the architect um, Royal Pineda. Would you like? You were asked by the government then to, to um, you know, to rehabilitate the worst airport in the world. So in the first few, in the, for, for eight months, we slaved on this, we worked on this, and we, you know, the parking lot, there, that, that's a parking lot today. We wanted to transform that into like a tropical oasis where you could pick up passengers along that whole, um, that entire loop. There was two loops, and this is the parking lot. You know. But sadly, it's still the worst airport in the world. You know. Not, nothing's been done, and uh, this went by the way of po politics. So um, I'm designing other things. This is an electric tricycle made out of uh, pressed metal. I'm designing a bamboo bicycle right now. These are just um, drawings still being developed. You know, bamboo bicycles today, bamboo bicycle design just looks like um, metal bicycle design. Well, they just replaced the metal structure with uh, with bamboo and there's not much thought behind it so <clears throat> decided to use a very thin thin strips just like that out of bamboo this is a prototype and we're using very very um, thin structural bamboo in the center so it um, it's it's not as rigid you know there's a there's a certain give to it so this is still being developed right now so I designed a few interiors also. This is the um, this is a bar in Cebu. If you ever happen to go to Cebu, you should check this bar out. It's called Morals and Malice. It used to be called a Z bar. Uh, and uh, structure is designed by um, architect uh, Ed Kama, the shell, and it's made out of solid um, onyx that's lit from below. And at night, you see all these bamboo glow like uh, fireflies. Uh, it's a small bar, but it's got this. The interiors is all handmade, it's all woven, and so it's been in a lot of, um, it's, been, it's got a lot of press abroad. It's on the cover of many, many design books also. So this is a bag I did for Tumi using ballistic nylon and uh, bamboo. Uh, it's expandable. And this is, I collaborate with people, this is the Belgian Fashion Runway. Um, I designed a silly uh, stick. We don't use these things anymore for Globe Telecom. A few years ago, you know, using like figures trapped, they look like figures trapped in ice. And um, we designed things like this is the Iron Man medal. This was the first um, Iron Man 70.3. And up to today, uh, I'm still doing their medals, I'm trying to get out from that job. Um, and this is the tricycle I made you know, called Eclipse. And I wanted to bring the romance back into tricycle travel. So this is a luxury um, tricycle. It has cup holders, iPad dock. You know, there's the, there's roof, there's covers to shield you from the rain. This is a tricycle in Paris. Okay, so I do also a lot of interiors around the world. This is the Nobu. This is the Nobu in Las Vegas. Just showing you very quickly some of the interiors we do. This is the Trump. Um, this is the Four Seasons in Dubai. Very beautiful hotel, spa hotel in Switzerland. 
Yeah, this is uh, the Fontana Park Hotel in Portugal, which won several awards. This is the, in Greece, and this is in, in Costa Rica. This is a design hotel. So I participate in shows around the world. In many of these shows, I am the only Filipino company. This is in Paris, Maison Roger. This is a few years ago. Um, and so this is my design for APEC. The recent APEC, this was the presidential, this was the state, the state dinner. Um, so they asked me to come up with a design. So this was the first rendering that I showed them. And Malacanian, they, they liked it right away, the social secretary. And uh, so I'll show you later on pictures of the real event. Um, okay, so these were the chairs that I designed for that. Uh, for that event, which the presidents would sit on, it was a variation of the Yoda chair. I had to use this chair because it was quite a well-known chair. You know? When the when the cameras go on it, it has to be known as a Filipino chair. So the chair swivels, and uh, this is the actual event. And uh, the government only borrowed the chair, so I had to sell it afterwards. So I donated about six of them to to UNICEF, and this sort of the, what it fetched, you know. In, in, in one hour, they raised eight million. Those valuable butts that sat in those chairs. <laughs> Canada is the most valuable there. Um, and uh, in fact, this, and so this was the actual event. You know, that I designed these maps. And I remember when back again here, just a few hours before. Just before a few hours before the president would come in, you know, the, the president looked at his design and said, "How come there are no flowers?" And so they wanted to change everything because they said it has to be tropical. They wanted to put in all the flowers and all the tables, everything. So I had to insist on the simplicity, and so they were very nervous. You know, but everybody loved it because it just carried also the message in our country that we were simple. You know, there was no frills. There was, it was only green plus the, the austerity of that black table. And uh, so, so in closing, I'll just show you some of the, oh, this is the actual event. Here, sound. Um, can you put the sound on? So there, that ends my presentation. And, uh, thank you very much. So, yeah, I, I'll take questions. I think we can discuss um, things which you want to know about, which I may not have covered. Questions from the floor? Comments? Hi, I am Juan Luna from Asia Pacific College. Hi. What is next for Kenneth Commonplay? Oh, I never know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, uh, before APEC came about, because I was very busy with this last year, I never knew that I was going to uh, that I was going to be doing that. So we're doing a lot of uh, different projects. Um, and uh, in fact, I never knew that I would be um, chair of the, you know, I never expected this to be chair of the program of, uh, here in Benil, and uh, I'm very proud, very happy to be with the Benil family, and to be able to impart you know, what I know to change the curriculum. Um, so we've been doing training with the faculty on form, because I want the whole curriculum to be centered on, uh, it's more a form, a form-based uh, curriculum. Because I think that many of the programs in the Philippines are all patterned after Western education where it's really designed for industry. We don't really have much of an industry here. Um, what we have are very, very small, small companies, very, a lot of craft based. And I think that our curriculum should be, um, you know, reprogrammed and um, rewritten to meet the challenge of our industry. Any other questions? 
and feel free to ask about anything. Oh, hello. Um, just wanted to ask, like you've mentioned earlier, that artists don't usually um, make money. Like that's what the usual people think. Um, what advice would you probably give to aspiring artists in the future? Um, I think if there are this, there's four things that I usually um, that you know if, if you have these four things, you will be successful. You know, and first is uh, you have to enjoy what you're doing. You have to like what you're doing. Second is you have to be good at what you're doing. That's why you're in school. So if you're a student, you know, always try to do good. Try put in your school, read up a lot. You know, um, in the internet, there's a lot of uh, things that are going on, and not only in the world of design, but also in fashion, in art, architecture. So it's important to be to love what you're doing, to be good at it, and uh, third is to to be able to to do what you do. You know, and uh, fourth is to be to make sure that the world is willing to pay for what you do. Okay, and that's very important. Following up on that uh, last um, thing that you mentioned about the world pay, you were in the news a couple of years back about um, following up on that. Uh, some of the people copied your designs for, uh, sorry, how is that going along? Have, have they stopped copying? No, they haven't stopped. Yeah, I, don't think, I think that's, a, that's an ongoing, never-ending battle. Um, so we've uh, gone after, you know, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite expensive to go after these, uh, uh, these pirates, okay? these people who copy, and uh, they're everywhere. Um, so most of the, contrary to what people believe, the Chinese don't really copy my, my furniture. Um, so, because they're very, first, the Chinese are not interested to make anything that's really handmade. They want to make things that are made in a machine. And th that's why I try to make my things, you know, as difficult as possible so the Chinese can copy it. And so, it's there, the, the, I get copied a lot here in the Philippines and in uh, countries like uh, Vietnam, Indonesia. Now, in fact, we have a very healthy market in China. So, here in the Philippines, we, we go after them. Uh, the intellectual property office is very supportive, and in fact, the courts are very, very supportive now against uh, um, intellectual property. It's different now than from it was years ago, uh, but it's very. And most of the cases, though, are pursued by multinational companies, maybe because they have more money to do it. But I feel it's very important for us to do it, um, not only for us but for the entire Filipino creative industry. And so, it's an ongoing battle. And so, I will. I'm still going to be in the news. For that. Um, good morning, Paul. I'm Brian Vitas, uh, BSID. Um, my question is about internship. How does someone become an intern in your company? So we accept interns, we accept only one or two a year. Um, so you can just apply, send in your portfolio, we look at it, you know, I'll talk with your teachers. And uh, of course, uh, people, you know, students from Benio get priority. Designs. Um, most of these designs are based on nature, beginning with the tree that you showed us in the video. But are there also other from like industries that you use the form to create, apart from the soda can? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, they've been uh, inspired by almost uh, anything there, from bicycle wheels to fashion to uh, yeah to to my dog. Yeah, I think inspiration comes from everywhere. There's really no formula for inspiration. You know, that would why it, that's why our job is so fascinating and difficult. But as you, the more you do it, the more you turn 
and find inspiration into something tangible, the better you get at it. So, like any other thing, design is uh, is a discipline. You know, it's like a sport. The more you do it, the better you get at it. So you have another question. Oh, sure. Okay, so my other question is, um, are you this? Uh, are you inspired by other designers as well? Or and if so, is your preference being inspired by other designers or by something tangible that you can see first time? Yes, I look at uh, designers. So not only product design, but also in architecture, uh, in, in fashion. You know, I used to like. Uh, Miyake, Issei Miyake from his early work in fashion. I like a lot of designers. I like uh, Santiago Calatrava, his architecture. Um, Gaudi, because they use nature as a reference. Um, there's, um, and, and I work with a lot of, uh, I look at Japanese, the Japanese fashion, because they're always doing interesting things. I look at uh, artists also, conceptual. I think you have to really uh, look at the whole world of design. Right? You can't just stay in your in your field to know what's going on. So I work with uh, designers like Marcel Wonders, uh, Ross Lovegrove. You know, these are designers that I used to read about as a student, and uh, they've come to visit me in Milan. And uh, two of them or three of them, you know, have, have come in fact to to Cebu to work with me, to learn about weaving, and uh, so it's a very fascinating exchange. And you say, and I uh, have one more. Sorry. Sure. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> um, my other question is, since we're in the Philippines right now, and you pointed out in your presentation a while ago that our our main craft is that we're still available with doing things handmade and nature, do you think we should stay there or we should start working on the other stuff that the other countries are also good at? I don't think we can ever stay there. I think the natural progression of countries is to turn, you know, as they become more richer, they industrialize. So it's natural that we take on, uh, you know, machines are going to replace many of the things that we do. But it's very important to still preserve that, that craft because that's something that we, I think the Filipinos, are the best, you know, as a country, our people are the best when it comes to hand handmade craft and skills. And I've gone to different countries looking at different factories, and the Filipino is second to none in the world when it comes to working with the hands. Let's see. Um, good morning, sir. I'm Nisha Tadjar from, from here, CSP. And I want it was mentioned earlier in the video that you that you are a perfectionist. How do you know when something is already perfect for you? So the yeah, I don't think you'll ever know. You know, and, and there are still designs that have been designed 15 years ago that were still changing, even up to today. So it's never perfect. And uh, the whole process of design takes about a year at least. And that's the fastest. Think from from concept to prototyping to changing to then we introduce it to the market and usually after the first market show it comes back again for another change and a revision of changes it goes out again and then we comes back again and we change it again so it always gets better year after year just like the car so I I think that uh, what's important is to always strive for that strive for perfection. So we know it. Hi, I'm Celine Placino, uh, taking up industrial design. And I would want to know what design principles or theories do you apply in your products? Okay, um, design principles, wow, that's a, <laughs> okay, that's a whole, that's a whole course. Because really, we're thinking of, right now, we're thinking of design theory class, and we talk about functionalism, formalism. Maybe I have to ask the faculty to see if they learn, learn anything from our, uh, from our courses. 
Yeah. I, I think the, if, if you see, there are no, there are no universal principles. I think that's what makes design fascinating is that it's not a science. You know? uh, science 2 plus 2 is always equivalent to 4 anywhere else in the world. And design, it's always subjective, right? But there are certain things that, um, that I've been trying now to, to, to teach, and to share with, uh, your fellow, with my fellow faculty here, some principles um, that I learned when I was studying at Pratt, you know, which Dean Joey also um, shares with me. You know, and this is, um, so we believe, I've always believed in form, that our, our responsibility to the world will always be, firstly, form. You know, when we say, yeah, it's form and function, but as designers, form should always be above function, okay? Now, I know this is controversial, but this is my belief, that for something, to me, for me to even try out a chair or to test a function, it has to be, it has to attract me first. You know? So our first, our first uh, responsibility to the world as designers is form, you know? And the function, if, if, if it were a function, then you'd probably be better studying engineering. So that's not to say that a thing is well made if it doesn't function well, no. You know? Because if a chair is not comfortable, then it has no reason to exist. But there are many, but I will buy, and then same, I will buy a piece of uh, clothing, I will buy a, a piece of chair, I will buy something because it just looks so beautiful even if it doesn't work. And that's the power of design. Okay, so what I'm trying to do now with the whole curriculum here is to make it form-based, that you master form. Because when I graduated from school back in New York, you know, I was studying design for Western industry, you know, for mass production, you know, we don't have any of that here. But what was left me was the, the understanding of form, the form as an abstract concept which is applicable in everything you do. And it's a visual language. So hopefully in a year's time, your faculty will share that same program to you. Does that answer your question? Sorry, it's a very difficult. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Deborah. I'm not a student anymore, but um, just on this topic, um, I was wondering, as you focused on form a lot, um, did you ever have trouble sort of testing a crazy design, like in terms of like like a chair, someone sat on it and eventually would break or something? Have you had <laughs> those kind of issues, or do you have those like crash test dummy kind of? machines that will test them, thanks. Yes, we do, uh, yeah, I've never had a chair break, okay? But I've had people say the chair is uncomfortable, that's very common. You always have to make the compromise between form and, and function. And uh, we, it's not in this video here, but we do testing. We go to the National Testing Institute where they have these machines that hammer your chair for you know 5,000 times until it fails. They come up with these reports. So they tilt your chair, they tilt, there's a drop test, there are all these tests which we do for, for our designs from a structural standpoint. But in the end, it's really about when you design furniture, it should be comfortable, it should work the way it was intended and for the purpose that it was made for. In fact, I was very confused when I came back. I was confused when I went there, then I was confused when I came back. Because it was very, very different. Um, the education was very different. It was really designed for mass production. So we learned about mold making and all different things, which you don't really use here. 
and here everything was made by hand. It's a different, it's a different whole concept of uh, of scale, you know, where you can afford to make um, something very intricate because we can afford to do that. We can do that, and uh, it's then that's why I wanted to change a bit of the curriculum, you know, in, in the schools. I founded the uh, industrial design program in UP Cebu because Cebu didn't have uh, Cebu was a center of the furniture industry, but it didn't have a design uh, program. I left I left the program a few years ago, and now I'm here. And uh, so what I'm trying to do is to use um, you know form form and materials and to take those as a point of departure. I have another question uh, with regards to uh, those who pursue biodegradable materials, you know, they recompose things to make things more, uh, like I said, biodegradable. Do you have uh, plans to pursue to collaborate with them? Example, uh, from garbage, right, you use recycled plastic, like you mentioned in your presentation earlier, recycled foam. How about those, like, really, or those who really came from garbage? Do you, do you have products or do you have plans that already uh, execute them? Yes. Um, the challenge with using garbage is that it sometimes, more often than not, it still looks like garbage when it comes out. And you can never attract people by uh, making it look like it's uh, environmentally friendly and biodegradable. You know? yeah, I think we're still not up to the point where people buy a product on the sole basis that it's environmentally friendly that it's biodegradable, I think we're not there yet, maybe in the future. So we always have to convince, um, it, it still has a lot to do with the design. And so we use a lot of uh, eco-friendly processes, we use, of course, the usual you know, water-based paint, we check where we buy our wood from, the, the basics. And uh, yeah, we're looking at, we're doing a lot of, uh, we use recycled foam, and many of the, I did show here, many of the designs, we use a lot of uh, you know, recycled, this and that. But we always have to look at how, you know, and I've, I've told this to the faculty, that um, why is a, uh, a Louis Vuitton bag you know, environmentally friendly? It uses PVC, it's probably bad, probably uses child labor, I don't know, but, <laughs> but why, why is that environmentally friendly? Have you ever seen somebody throw a Louis Vuitton bag? So these challenges, the way we look at, at at design, that something can be so valuable, that we make something so well, that is treasured for generations to come. Speaking of legacy, are there any designs of your mother's furniture that you uh, based some of your design or built up on? Yeah, no, sadly, the techniques that uh, my mom used to make are too expensive to to make now. The, the, her processes, this, this technique of working with this kind of rattan, is so expensive and so tedious that uh, no one can make them anymore and no one will pay for them. So in fact, we have only about three, I think, of the designs left. And uh, the craftsmen who used to make that are slowly, very few of them around. And so I say one day, probably a lot of the things that I do will be too expensive to make, in, in this country at least. How do you make it you know, sustainable in terms of the design? It's kept alive, or you have a part of the catalog. Yeah, we just come up with new designs. Yeah. I think that's the way to make yourself relevant and, uh, and sustainable. And we always ask, when you make a design, we always ask ourselves, what's, what's the reason, what's the purpose of this design? Because the world doesn't need another chair. And so what makes my design so different? What can it contribute to the global world of design? Why should I even make this chair? Uh, and that's what I also ask students a lot. You know, that you should ask yourself, why, what's the reason? Why, why do it this way? And you should always ask, why use this material when you can use this material? You know? And why, uh, you have to justify the existence of your design. Um, 
I found your car really interesting, the design, and I was also wondering how fast does it go? And um, further than that, are you interested in making more designs for transportation, especially looking at the transport situation here in the country? It's really kind of bad. Like, would you be interested in doing something sustainable in that way? Yes. Um, which car are we talking about? The electric um, car or the, the electric the bamboo? The, yeah, that one. The bamboo car, yeah. Uh, we've never never put an engine in it, but it's now in a university in Germany where they're trying to build an engine for it. You know, I'm trying to make different prototypes. Um, yeah, we're, I'm doing an electric car also. But again, I always question myself whether, why, why do it, you know? I mean, if, if I were to do something like that, there has to be a reason why it should be made in the Philippines, you know, and not just because I'm a designer and I can sell this for X amount of money, but to ask always, can I do something better than the electric tricycles out there? Can I do something that's different, that's Filipino, that's uh, unique? And uh, those are very difficult questions to answer. But I'd like to work, you know, transportation has always been a uh, love of mine, you know, it's a, it's a hobby of mine. You know, I collect vintage uh, vintage cars, and uh, I've always been fascinated with things that move. I'm Nicole Sanchez from ID. So, in, in all of your designs, do you have um, a design which is you could say your greatest masterpiece. And if you're gonna have your chair in the Vintra Design Museum in Germany, what would it be? Sorry, what was the last question? Um, if you're gonna have your design chair in Vintra Museum, what would it be? Oh, okay, yeah. I've always asked myself that, actually. <laughs> and it's a difficult question to answer, because I always think that the next one is still gonna be better than the previous one. But it is very difficult, and the pressure is really, it's uh, it's a lot, you know. The, the pressure is very, very heavy, and it gets heavier every year. To try to always outdo yourself, to try to always make something better, it gets more and more difficult. Not only for me, but believe me, for every designer out there. And I've been to, I go to all the shows, the design shows around the world. In fact, I'm going to Milan again in a week. And for the last three years, there's really nothing new. In Milan, there's nothing new in the world of design, and which is, which is kind of sad. And uh, I think there's more things going on in music and in fashion than in design. But probably because it's the state of the global economy, companies are not investing anymore in in new design, and there's not much. It's not very. There's not much out there. Which design of mine for the Vitra Museum? I, I don't know. I, we have different, um, different, I'm known by different, uh, no, I would say, different designs have become iconic depending on which country. And here, of course, in the Philippines is the Yoda chair, probably because the easiest to copy. You know, <laughs> and the stool with the, with, the, with the pegs, the Chiquita stool. Um, from industrial design. Um, you were talking about the pressure each year it increases, and knowing that you're a perfectionist, and maybe a lot of us are, at a certain point, it becomes paralyzing. How do you overcome that? So you take a break, you take a vacation. It's a, it's, in design is a discipline. So what I do is I always try to set aside time every day to design, like an hour at least. And sometimes it comes, sometimes it doesn't. But the important thing is you always have to allot a certain fixed time of the day to, to design. And uh, you, you do that, you try to keep to that schedule every day until it becomes a habit. And you become really good at it. But sometimes it doesn't come, you take a break. You know, and when you go back again, you look again at your sketches, and then you think, you know, and, and it's been proven that it's better to stop working on something and to you know, 
take your mind off it and look at it again. You'll see new ideas, you, you, you'll discover new things, guaranteed. Do you work better in the mornings, or what, what, when do you do your designs? Oh, any time, any time of day. So yeah. Just one hour, any time? Yes, yes. Usually in the evening, when it's quiet. Hi. Uh, my name is Dice. Um, I have a question. Um, what would you consider as your first big break, and how long did it take for you to get there? I didn't really have one big break. I think it was a series of uh, small breaks. So the first break was, was I guess it was Movement 8. I don't know if you know this. It's an organ. It was, uh, uh, it was funded by the government, by SciTech, and they wanted to, with Puji Layug and the founder, um, Eli Pinto of, uh, the late Eli Pinto of Saitem, they wanted to, they, there was a search for eight of uh, designers from around the country who would represent the Philippines abroad, and I was chosen to be one of them. And that time I only had two designs. It was the yin and yang, the very squarish one, and the balloon. And uh, we, so we exhibited with government money, we were showing everywhere, and we got the best this is the first time the Philippines got pole position. We were center stage of every, almost all design shows in the world. So from Cologne to New York to Shanghai, and we got a lot of press. And people were, were very, people were all surprised, you know. They were, we, we caused quite a sensation. And in fact, that was the first time that people probably knew that there was a Filipino, Philippine design industry. Um, from there, I then understood that uh, that unique design has a place in the world. And uh, from then, I started to create my brand, and then, you know, um, the, other, the other designers have since left to make their own paths, you know, some in design, some outside design, but I carried on, and uh, yeah, I think over the other, the other breaks, um, well, I must say Brad Pitt was a brick, you know, for whatever it's worth. You know, he was a he was a good commercial uh, commercial thing because that kind of news is important for um, not all countries. In the United States, they don't care for it, but countries like the Philippines and Latin America, you know, Brad Pitt is a big deal. Um, like, um, you mentioned earlier that in the world of design, um, um, rarely things are new and, and everything's probably already been done. But, but what makes a certain design stand out for you and make it timeless? Um, I actually, I always debunk the myth that everything's been done in design. Because there's still a lot, you know, I, I don't think everything's been done. There are still a lot of things waiting to be discovered. I think it's there's many many things that make a design timeless, you know, and um, it's a it's a different. It's the same in anything. It can be music or anything. When you introduce something new in terms of uh, can be usually it's material or a production process or the form or technique, but there's always something that's unique and something that's new in the world of, in the global world of design, in design history, that you did something that was different at that, that time. And that's what makes it timeless. Hello. Um, on the other side of that, um, what designs don't you like? Like things that you're not particularly a big fan of? Either that or architecture, chairs, certain things that either been mass produced and you just don't like seeing those things, or yeah. What designs don't I, I like? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wow, we could stay here the whole day. <laughs> Easier is designs that I like, probably. <laughs> that I don't like. Um, I don't. 
I don't like the fact that most of the things that are mass market have to be made in China. You know, you go to a middle class home and he has the monoblock chair, the plastic table, well, everything's made in China. And I think that's, that's sad. But the world of mass manufacturing the, the, and something that can be afforded by people, the people can afford it, has to be made in China. You know, this design that I don't like. I don't like design where we have to pretend that we're in some other country with this Mediterranean theme or this kind of, you know, that we have to, that we, we have to um, pretend like we're someplace else. Um, yeah, I could go on and on, but, <laughs> um, but it's, of course, harder to make a design that, that is likable than a design that's not. Uh, hello, I'm Mary Nobleza. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our dean. Dean, can you stand up for, for everyone? Okay, well, it's an open house anyway for everyone. Um, thank you, and we would just like to tell you that sometimes Sir Kenneth would also assist the students in taking time to look at their designs, and he does. He does sit down with you. And for many people who would ask, does he get to teach in the field? No, he doesn't. He trains up and willing. Uh, his time is devoted to consultations for students. If you have any queries on your designs. This afternoon, um, 1 o'clock until 4 p.m., he is open. He has an open time to see consultations from students. Is that true? Or are we scrapping yes, yes. it? Okay, yeah. and also for so the design. Use that, yeah, use that moment. It's rare. <laughs> yes, I believe so. And also, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to tell the students that we are on board Manila Fame this April, and we are accepting your projects as video projects. And again, Sir Kenneth will take a look at it. Thank you. How did it go about? Uh... We will be at. 12 12 this afternoon, 1 o'clock to 4 p.m. 12 12. Thank you. Other comments or questions? If there are none, on behalf of MCAD and the Industrial Design Program, we would like to thank you for coming to the talk of Sir Ken Kovanberg and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.